Hey folks, welcome to this presentation, Data, What We Lose When We Treat Students as Objects. Uh, I'm Lance Eaton, and this presentation is more an explanation, uh, exploration of where our choices are leading us and leading our students. The, pandem the pandemic has expedited the rate at which we are taking on a lot of different technology, uh, often with scant attention to the downstream effects. So I want to pose some questions and considerations for us to look at as we begin interacting less with students and more with student data files and the problems that arise when we confuse these things as the same things. I also want to highlight what's below the surface of these choices that students, faculty, support folks, and administration doesn't always see. What is the harm that can be done when we use technology to mitigate relationships in teaching and learning? They can be enhanced, absolutely. Yet, we are, are we also missing something because we're only looking at the surface level? I think so. So, we can look at these headlines and give a chuckle, right? A story where, you know, where students creating connections with chatbots chat to the point that programmers need to create scripts for those attachments. The flip side of that story is where a president wants a bot of himself to be able to connect with all of his students. We can think of a dozen funny things to say about these things, but I want to think about here is what, tra what we're training students for. We're talking about, we often talk about developing soft skills, but we're automating that in deciding some students get chat bots in fictional presidents, while others get the real thing. Can we take a guess as to the socio-cultural makeup of students who get to interact with real people are? Exactly. My question is though, who gets to see this data? Where is the data stored? What kind of action will result from this data? And do students know, really know, what all of this means? I say really know because of course, I'm sure each instance of this will come with a 50 page end user agreement that allows no choice in, that in the user, but all the power in the company with the program. So, Maybe that feels a little bit too abstract or, or distant right now. So let's start to ground it in some recent examples and concerns. We have to recognize that we, while we are using many different data tools in higher education, we're not really sure what most of them are, who runs them, and what their goals are. I go back to one of my earlier experiences where the CIO of a college I worked at, that is the chief information officer, was not an actual employee of the college, but worked for the network system that we used for facilitating all information exchange internally. Where was that person's priorities? What did that person want out of our systems? What did that person get to see out of us and use that for encouraging or uh, helping the company over necessarily the institutional's interest? In a similar vein, as we make use of our learning management systems that are owned by private equity groups or make use of third-party vendors for a variety of tools that, uh, that we then require students to use, how are we making students beholden to entities which have no responsibility to them and can use their data in ways beyond their control? And as we incorporate third-party vendors to jazz up our courses, we also begin to cross borders with our students that can result in negative or harmful consequences. And then we get into some of the tools that we are using that are intentionally used to track, spy, and control students with levels of surveillance that would sound stalkerish if we were talking about any other human-based relationship. And of course, they are too poor, they are doing poorly at treating our students as humans and protecting them from unwanted risk. That is, of course, when the companies are creating software, creating software that creates more problems for students because the underlying artificial intelligence and programming is biased towards certain types of bodies, causing innocent students to have to defend themselves against accusations about cheating from a machine. Do you know how to argue with a machine? Do, can our students know how to argue with a machine? Because how do you argue against a machine as a student? Can you rationalize with it? 
Can you rationalize with it? Can you question its programming? Can you even get access to its code because it's an, it is intellectual property and subject to patent and copyright protect, protections? So what happens when traditionally alienated students must now convince machines that they are not suspect, aberrations, or flawed beings, but rather the machine itself is the problem? The machine that the institution has spent lots of money on so it can automate this process of catching students. Of course, then there's the fact that some companies, like Proctorio, are going to legally are, are legally going after students and companies who are critical of their work. That's not reassuring in the least. Of course, if you're reading the education news, the discourse is lively and ongoing. Overall, ed tech tools are here to stay, but what about the creepy ed tech? Is that going away? The answer is not really. The tech will continue to stay around. In should we have to pivot again into remote learning, we'll likely go right back to this game of using student data as stand-in for students and making assumptions based on that. That's concerning because it reinforces an antagonistic relationship with students. That in itself is a problem, but particularly as there are there is a larger discourse critiquing and dismissing higher education, we're only helping that cause as we direct students to chatbots, give them over to third-party vendors who sell their data, and then use surveillance tech to control them, because we don't trust them nor give them effective means to assess, or, or give them effective means to assess them. This can result in real harm for students. This whole conversation has been in my head, developing for years, but it was the Dartmouth Medical School incident that escalated it for me. The basic rundown of what happened is in January of 2021, I'm not sure why that is uh, messed up like that, but we'll keep running with it. Faculty members reported, reported uh, faculty members reported perceived violations of academic integrity. Uh, to the Committee on, on Student Performance and Conduct. The, the committee investigated it and eventually by March sent out 17 letters to meet with the committee. Uh, about a month later, 10 out of those 17 were notified of violations and, pos and possible sanctions against them for said violations. Now, what tools did they use to determine this? Did they, were they using ExamSoft, Turnitin, Dot com, Proctorio, Respondus, Onalock. These are just a handful of the various surveillance uh, ed tech tools out there to track students when they are well, a as part of their learning process and to catch them cheating or assume that their data is evidence of them cheating. So they, this is what they had set up. Uh, they had all students using one computer it to which they would be subject to using ExamSoft, which would monitor what they were doing. Then they were also, it's unclear if they were was required or strongly encouraged to have a second computer, a backup computer, if the first computer fails. Um, I want to think about, I just want to put in there kind of that that idea of, of, you know, you need a backup to your security, you need a second backup for your for you know this system and that system too would also need to have exam soft which is of course tracking and surveilling um, their activities on the computer so they needed that they but that isn't what Dartmouth used to actually f uh, accuse these students of academic dishonesty all they were largely using was canvas as a forensic tool and Canvas is not a forensic tool, but that is what they were using. Uh, and then once they accused the students, they provided students with limited information about their case. They would not give them the full data logs or anything like that. They just they gave them a limited set of information within this within this accusation. From there, the story kind of evolved. It got picked up by the New York Times, and then you had the electronic fire <laughs> the electronic foundation. Uh, Freedom Foundation and FIRE, a um, couple of organizations, as well as student protests start to really push back. And as June rolls around, Dartmouth rescinds those accusations. Uh, somehow in taking it back, it's no harm has been done. But of course, 
this has been going on for students for over three months. Uh, their academic standing is challenged, is raised into question, and they are sitting in the state of like, am I getting expelled from, from medical school? Um, so there is some real harm being done here of those students really having to do that and also raises the question, if this was not Dartmouth Medical School, if the New York Times or the EFF or FIRE or didn't pick these things up, would those accusations stand even though the tool that they were, the, the tool that they were using didn't actually, couldn't actually do the thing that they, they said it was able to do? So the following are a set of questions we should be asking about the tools and ultimately our own approaches and frameworks for teaching and learning. These are, these are conversations faculty should be thinking about in their own practices, with their colleagues, with the uh, instructional design folks at their institutions, and even the administration and uh, the students as well. So at the core of this, I think we're ultimately asking the wrong questions of our educational technology. I think we're drawing the wrong conclusions, and I think we're leaving students stuck with those consequences. So what are the internal assumptions and risks involved when we use digital educational technology? We're often aware of the immediate trade-offs of ed tech. If I spend some time learning this tool, then it may offer me quicker or more engaging results. But we sometimes miss the associative fallacies that come with each tool. Take the learning management system as an example. We often frame that as our virtual classroom. By doing so, it leads us to believe that we should have full control of the space and the students should be subject in that space. That comes both with the way that the tool is structured and the, the way we think about or make the leap from a physical classroom to a virtual classroom. And that's where risk arrives because that working metaphor then gives us way more power over the student than we would ever have in the classroom. We can control what they see and when they see it. We can see details into their lives and their actions that we would never have access to in day-to-day -day lives, such as how much time they spend on any given activity or resource. We can see whether they have or haven't accessed a lot of granular data. And like Dartmouth Medical School, we can use that to build a case against them without them ever knowing or being able to see what we see. What information is being collected about our students and how is, and how is it being reconfigured to tell us a story about them? What gets tracked is what is trackable but doesn't necessarily tell us a clear story we often fill in the gaps or our assumptions fill in the gaps. This is what happens when we look at students with an eye towards cheating. Often we look at what is collected and then backfill the narrative rather than asking if we have the full story or if our paradigm of cheating is actually the problem. Since every click in an LMS is captured and this is the same for any third party vendor, this means that this, for both students and faculty, it raises a lot of questions about who decides what gets collected and who gets access to this. So who and what are systems are collecting this data and what stories are they telling with it? In the LMS, faculty can largely access every click of the students. And whether they realize it or not, some administrators can access every click of the faculty. So who gets access to, to, to that and what stories do they interpret from that digital breadcrumb trail? Because time and again, I think our assumptions from what we see are going to misguide us since we're only looking at the data file and not at the person. There's a, you know, there is a disconnect between those two that we're not always making. We assume they are one in the same. And I think that's where that's one of the places we are going astray. So in a piece I wrote a few months ago, uh, I made an argument that a lot of people felt uncomfortable with. I said, students should have the same level of data access to their instructors as instructors do of their students. Would this change a faculty member's behavior in the LMS if a student could see how much time they spent on grading, dis reading discussion posts, etc.? And if so, would we find faculty gaming the system with different apps or tools to make it look like they were doing the work? If the answer is yes to either of these, then we need to reconsider what does it mean about who gets access to the data in these, spe in these spaces and who doesn't? 
When it comes to third-party vendors, do you or your students have a say in any of this? Right. So who has access to that data and who does not? And then what does that mean for what we can see and who gets to see? So what is done with that data? Does anyone know how long the data lives on after it is collected, how it is used, how responsible is are the data collectors to share directly if there has been a theft of that data? The lingering question I think about here is, uh, is centered in Chris Gilliard's concept of digital redlining and Sh 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 Shoshana Zuboff's concept of surveillance capitalism. In both of these cases, we see that the wheeling and dealing of information gleaned from a variety of sources can lead to limiting opportunities or hyper surveillance in the case of digital redlining for individuals from communities that have been marginalized, or how much more information is collected on a person, even when they would prefer that not be the case. Again, it's worth reminding ourselves that some of the major LMSs are owned by private equity entities who also own lots of other data collecting businesses. Similarly, third party vendors, uh, similarly with third party vendors, they are often as in it as much in as much in it for the data and selling of that data as they are for the tools that they're actually offering. Right. This is that concept. If you are if you if you aren't paying for it, you are the product. And so this is the crux of, of the concern I'm thinking about. These are cruel, crude tools that don't help us to humanize and understand our students, but to process them. Our students are struggling with a world that feels less and less stable, whether it's the environment, the job market for jobs, uh, for jobs that pay living wage, at least, uh, health care and mental health, a pandemic, housing affordability, and many other challenges that we likely do not know. The data these tools show us will not help us understand this and understand them, but it has a lot of potential for us to do more harm. So I come back to this question because I think we need to do more than just be mindful about data structures we are navigating. We have to make sure that we are asking or demanding students we have to make sure that if we are asking or demanding students use these tools that they fully understand what is at stake because it doesn't look like it is stopping anytime soon and in fact may be getting worse. So what responsibilities do we as educators invested in equity have in making clear what is and can happen to their information on these platforms? We have some of these proctoring sites in the name of security catching students, creating other websites that are intentionally structured to offer false answers and catch them. That is, we're entering into this weird space of entrapment efforts by the services that we're likely paying for to go and validate their work by enticing students to break the rules set up within a course. This is not normal, and yet this is what we're seeing happening. And maybe you're not using proctoring tools in just relying on the learning management system. That doesn't necessarily mean much in protecting your students from data abuse. After all, if Canvas's rating here as a 63% was a grade, it wouldn't be able to transfer with credits in privacy to any other institution. And it's not just the LMS. As we move into eBooks, traditional publishers see this as a boon, not just to contractually control what students can see, that is, you no longer buy ownership, but you buy six months access. And after that, you can't actually go back to it. Um, but also they are using student labor to improve the product and therefore be able to down the road, charge more for students and schools in the long run. So they are also now extracting resources, extracting labor from students so that they can find ways to further sell uh, the same things that they're doing now and also newer products. And all of this points to a bigger problem. How much and who is taking in that data and for what purpose? I don't see this as a scare tactic of big tech is watching. Rather, it comes from a place of seeing a strong disconnect around tools, data, in the actual lived experiences of students. Sometimes these may align, but when they do, when they go astray, 
they are likely to go wildly astray, and often in ways that alienate people on the margins within the Institute. This seems to be the exact opposite of what we're striving to do. So I leave you with this as some food to thought, some food for thought to, to consider as you use the different tools uh, throughout your educational institute and think about what does that mean for your students. Thank you very much.